can see some pretty iconic uh, robots and droids, if you will, behind you. Uh, I see R2's hanging out here. That's, I'm very uh, pleased to have R2 as a guest in our uh, in our <laughs> podcast here. He, he, he heard you were here, so he had to come in. Awesome. I'm, I'm, making, I'm, I'm getting big if R2 wants to see me. So, Fawn Davis, thanks for joining Cup of Joe. I appreciate it, buddy. Um, we've known each other for a lot of years now. Uh, yeah. I wanted to go through a little bit of your background and kind of touch on we first met back at ILM. Uh, yeah. You also worked at some other large studios, Leica is another well-known one. You worked at uh, New Deal. Uh, some of the offshoots of the of, of ILM after it moved were like 3210 and some of the Kerner companies you've worked for out there. And of course, you work uh, you've, all this time, you've maintained Fonco, your own uh, company that's at this point a wide range of services, of production, yeah. production services, which we'll probably go through in a little bit. Um, and really you've contributed to a lot of the pop culture iconic images. I know you're a humble guy and I don't mean to embarrass you, but really I was looking at your, your, your history and you could start with going all the way back to, I believe you made the big swirl in Nightmare Before Christmas that everyone notices on the poster and in the- And I got to make two of the multiple swirls. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. uh, the, the, the one that I'm most proud of is actually the one that's in the end of the movie. I got to do the snow covered spiral. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then I did the one for the poster, which was uh, because I had covered the original that uh, someone else had made with snow and icicles. <laughs> <laughs> oops. <laughs> and they were like, hey, we want to use that for the poster. And um, I said, oops, um, it's covered in snow. <laughs> so nice. we just made a new, a new uh, spiral, just the top part of it there. Some of your, my favorite sci-fi movies and, and, and whole um, uh franchises you've worked on and of course the star wars franchise many of the star wars movies um yeah. star trek that that franchise galaxy quest mars attacks elysium interstellar i'm just flagging my favorites here um, <laughs> right I think these are all all great um i think elysium really was groundbreaking and it's it is underappreciated for for what it did uh, when it came out um interstellar of course was appreciated for what it did when it came out um and so you know you've worked with a lot of the great filmmakers you've obviously you know whether it was the model makers at ilm and the filmmakers you know working with george lucas you've worked with a lot of the personalities and one of the personalities i wanted to ask you about uh, most importantly was Danny Trejo on the Brisk ad. So you, <laughs> <laughs> I was creative. a production designer on that. Yeah. So yeah. this is the this is the Brisk ad. I'm sure I'll, I'll show a, a little clip or an image of it here. Uh, it's pretty well, pretty famous, uh, very well done. I guess stop motions was the way yeah. it was would be fine as. And uh, I'm guessing you got to meet Danny Trejo. I mean, he's in, that's, in that's crazy. The things you bring up are different than most most uh, times I talk to people about this stuff because you brought up <laughs> Mars Attacks, which is one of my favorites, and no one ever talks about it. <laughs> it's so underappreciated. Then, I know Brisk. Uh, the Brisk ad campaign was, to this day, still one of the most fun projects I've ever worked on. Like, hands down, it was so much fun. A lot of it had to do with the set that we built for the uh, the, the, the Danny Trail. Um, it, was, um, it was a machete in, in 30 seconds. Or something. Someone opened an escape like Rapunzel. Then I wash my hands and make love to a beautiful woman who runs a taco truck and a revolution. But a guy blows up her house. While well, a sexy lady cop takes a shower and I make love to the rich guy's women. Then I wash my hands. The director, uh, he had this great idea of making sets uh, kind of like a character in the commercial. So, um, you know, he wanted it to be alive and move and shift and rotate and do all this stuff. And so... Um, I had actually built uh, a foam core model of what I, I was proposing for the set overnight from our first meeting to our second meeting. And that's what's in the commercial. Uh, and it flipped and it rotated, did all this stuff. And then me and uh, Misha Klein, uh, he was the animation supervisor, made a, we called it a model-matic in the conference room at Mechanism, which was the ad agency. Um, with the foam core model and little characters on coffee stir sticks. <laughs> and we shot the whole commercial with this little foam core model and the audio that Danny Trejo had done a, a scratch track. And uh, so when we, uh, we, we shot all that, we put it to the, to the audio overnight and then we presented it in the morning and then they presented that to Pepsi and that's how they landed the campaign. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, as far as all that Star Wars stuff, let the other podcasters and videos, you that's all been covered. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, I mean, really, uh, yeah, it, the, the, the whole Star Wars, uh, 
era was a great time to work at ILM. I mean, I don't oh, know, absolutely. Just, just bypass that. I mean, I started uh, in 96, I think uh, somewhere around the same time you started maybe a little before or after that, but that was right when special edition was going into full. Yeah, no, that was, that was uh, the year I started in 96 having worked there was is beyond a blessing right i mean i've always looked at it yeah. just in just the absolute apex and in fact it's kind of hard going on because not every place is ilm yeah you, you find out when you leave ilm uh, it kind of spoils you a little bit uh, yes. and um you also you did call work- it the country club uh the local 16 used to call it the country club so when i got my job i was on metro an eddie murphy movie <laughs> i actually quit it was the only job i ever quit but i got a job offer to go to ilm's model shop so i'm like i quit <laughs> Yeah, and they said, the- oh, you're going to the country club. You know, that was that was the perspective from anyone who worked in the film industry uh, in the San Francisco area of Ireland. Yeah, a lot of the other film uh, film union jobs weren't as glamorous, for sure. And in fact, oh. that union, that IATSE element really is what made, I think, ILM feel like a Hollywood studio uh, in a good way. You know, the good good parts. I um, mean, yes. you really felt like you were at a uh, embassy of Hollywood when you were there. And, and, and the IATSE union really, I think, helped create that environment. Well, for Fonco, let's talk about, I can see that in the background there, that that's your shop there. I can see some pretty iconic uh, robots and droids, if you will, behind you. Uh, I see R2's hanging out here. That's, I'm very uh, pleased to have R2 as a guest in our, uh, in our <laughs> podcast here. He, he, he heard you were here, so he had to come in. <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm getting big if R2 wants to see me. Um, uh, so, so Fonco, I mean, he, we, we, I, I met, I met him years ago. Uh, yeah. I, uh, Fonco, I probably imagine, always offered you the ability to show off your work and your latest skills, even though you were working on other things within the major studios. You've had Fonco going the whole time. So yeah. it's a good, good reason to have a parallel track of, of your creative craft so that you can show the latest and not wait four years. Yeah. Um, my, well, uh, my favorite part about having my own company is um, I, I'm never laid off. <laughs> <laughs> you might be broke, but you're never laid off. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and you also eased into it for a lot of years. So you never had that, like you left ILM and then had to invest in a startup. But by the time you left ILM, you you probably had built quite a, a yeah. studio. It was it was to fill time between feature film work. And as you know, uh, being in the Bay Area, there was that time period. Um, I, I would I want to say post two thousand eight. Where- after the writer's strike. It was after the writer's strike. We had this huge dip that hit the industry, took out yeah. a bunch of studios. That's when the orphanage went away. Uh, some other studios got hit hard. Um, yeah. That was a tough few years for everyone. It's amazing what a writer's strike can do. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. We, we, we do a ton of work that just, you know, we sign NDAs and then um, we don't, you know, we just don't talk about it. We don't see it for sometimes years. This is a problem that a lot of individual artists have putting together reels because they want to put together their most recent work, but they can't because that work either hasn't come out yet or if it's come out yet, they haven't fully disclosed who worked on it. Whether it's studios themselves or individual artists are often highlighting work that's two or three years behind what their actual effective curve is and what they can do. This is why studios, this is why individuals put their personal work in their art, uh, in their reel, because you need to put something relevant and new, uh, yeah. not something four years of, of skills ago. And studios also will do shorts or, or try to work on commercials and things that will highlight those very same skills in, in a shorter period of time because they need to show the world and what they can do and get work on it. And it's really hard when they have to be quiet for like two years after a release or a year oh, after yeah. a release. Yeah, I've, I've been sitting on some stuff for, what is that? I think the longest project that's still kind of floating around out there is from six years ago. Yeah, we still can't talk about Frankenstein at ILM. No, I'm just kidding. No, that's like- <laughs> For those who know, <laughs> but yeah, no, some things. One of my, one of my uh, employees made this pin a number of years ago. Uh, Max Weber, he he did this pin. It says, uh, "All my best work is under NDA." <laughs> it's so true. Because <laughs> that's that it is. It is. A, it's a real problem. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How do you tell everyone what you can do if you can't tell people that you did it, right? Yeah, I got to talk on Gods. Gods of Mars is really exciting. Uh, uh, oh, there is. Oh, shoot. No, it's not public yet. Oh, darn. It's funny because it's going to it's going to. It's going to hit, I think, in two weeks. Uh, but we're working on we're, we are doing a lot of exciting stuff in robotics. Um, oh. It's it's, you know, we're talking about it earlier. Uh, you know, we touched on it. Um, you know, I feel like this studio is uh, built of different departments and each department revolves around a different community. Um, 
so obviously, you know, I, I was, uh, I got that 3d printer before ILM even had a 3d printer or Disney when I was working at IMD. Um, so we would use my 3d printer because <laughs> it was a $40,000 machine. And I, I ended up doing conferences and talking about 3d printing all over the world because people really never use 3d printers to the extent and push the envelope as quite as much as we did doing, you know, the kind of work that we did, uh, so that, that became a whole community. And now we've got uh, all these partnerships with different companies that make 3D printers. And I actually literally got one sent to me for free to try it out, to give them feedback, stuff like that. Um, so we're able to stay ahead of the curve on that. Um, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, I learned how to use the cyber scanner there at ILM. That was a great opportunity as well. Cause then I got into laser scanning and, and uh, working with, uh, first it was next engine. And then uh, now we're working with another um, 3d scanning company called our uh, Also working at IMD, we got into performance capture, you know? And so I started getting, I met a lot of people in that community. And now we have uh, a partnership with Noitum here at our studio. We have a uh, 22 camera perception neuron uh, performance capture volume with an uh, optical capture as well as inertial capture. Uh, mm -hmm capability um we have we are getting our second led wall installed into the studio we're experimenting with that technology as well uh so and we have an unreal station we've got some great technology partners on gods of mars um that are that are helping us with um you know all the workflows and it's all very new technology so having these partnerships are really important um so there's just there's just a lot of activity here I, i'll say um, the, the move to LA was a really good thing. Um, and then, oh, the robotics community, of course, being involved in battle bots and having a, uh, a short amount of time working with R2D2 there. And um, we got to spend a year working with Hanson Robotics, which was, uh, they make Sophia, which is the AI robot that was made famous on MSNBC for saying that she wanted to destroy all humans. <laughs> I think I remember that, yes. So we had the Los Angeles uh, maintenance and, and repair and upgrade shop at Fonco Studios for a year. And I got to go to Hong Kong and work out of their headquarters there and really, uh, you know, um, work on that robot. And, and so being a part of that community has led me into a lot of different areas of robotics, including uh, a very recent project that'll be announced in two weeks. If uh, any of you guys are interested in seeing all the weird things that we work on um, out there uh, watching Cup of Joe, <laughs> It, you should uh, check out my social media. We have a Fonco Studios at Fonco Studios, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and then uh, at Fon H Davis. I'm on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and and YouTube. Um, I'll put links to all that down below for sure. Yeah. yeah so, we're, but we're we're doing just. It's fun. It's really fun, and and Hollywood right now is just a really. It's a really exciting time to be here. Because it is so, there are so many groundbreaking pieces of uh, technology happening right now. And we're so lucky to have Fonco and, and to have this production studio because all the, the great new virtual production tools uh, mesh perfectly with all the tools that we already have here at the studio. So we're, we're very excited about all the uh, endless possibilities of what we could do with this technology. When you combine, you know, 3D scanning and 3D printing and, and uh, you know, the, the, the Unreal Engine and, and the, the powerful computers and um, the stumbling blocks of the past are quickly being swept aside and it seems like it's all happening at one time. Yeah. So. It's, it's gonna, all very collaborative too. It's all very, uh, all very complimentary and it yeah. all like you can take a, a design and you can, you know, make a 3D model of it. You can make a physical 3D model of it, digital 3D model. You can render it in, in, in a real time 3D. You can do all of this. You can attach a, a motion capture person to that character and have them start animating it. You can start taking the AI, like what DD and other folks are doing with AI and speech engines, like you saw with Sophia now getting intertwined into all that. Yeah. It, it's admittedly sometimes a little spooky, but moving very, very <laughs> fast. I'd say it's often very spooky. <laughs> yeah, the AI stuff uh, that I've been hearing about and 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 learning about is probably some of the spookiest. Yeah, uh, well, that's you why know. you got to work in robotics. These are all my friends now. You know, I could say I'm friends with R2D2 here and and Sophia and 
and uh, you know um, some other uh, robots that are going to be coming out soon. So um, you know you gotta you gotta build that social network among the robots. So when the uprising happens, you're not in danger. Uh, it is mind blowing looking back at just just 10, 15 years ago. Let alone when we first started ILM. I think I think we're we're right on the edge of a real revolution too uh, in in technology uh, in terms of virtual production. You just yeah. feel it. You could feel it. The talk, the 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 push I, for it. Um, I can't tell you how many new virtual production. I mean, like, I literally like because my DA can't tell you how many new virtual production facilities are opening up in yeah. North America. I'll say yeah. um, it's it's out of control, and what everybody's buying this year is going to be outstripped greatly by what's coming out next year. Right, uh, and and it's really That's moving so we, fast. We, we rent or borrow LED walls. We don't buy them. <laughs> It's sort of like, you know, I have a similar philosophy on it now after uh, talking with a lot of people in that field is, you know, there's the, the it's like a camera that they come up with a new camera every year. And it's really difficult to wrap your brain around buying a camera and all the gear that you need for it and spend 30, 40, maybe a hundred thousand dollars. And then next year it's, it's no longer the top of the line. The idea of OPEX, meaning operational expense of renting or, 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 or just taking what you need when you need it. And whether it's, you know, you think, you think about the concept of car share or the cloud, it's generally getting into all of our workflows. This idea of why do I need to own something when I just need it for five minutes or a day or a year, and I'm not going to need it for two years. And I want to want the new one in two years. So the idea of OPEX or consumption models where you just pay for what you need and then sort of hand it back, whether it's storage, whether it's compute, whether it's camera gear, um, it's becoming the way to, and you pay a premium by the way, Mm -hmm. but you are alleviated of all those long-term, uh, 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 encumbrances of having this technology and being stuck in legacy and yeah. the folks that are bringing a premium are making a profit off it. So it's one of those free markety solutions that really helps everyone out. But the idea of switching from OPEX to, or from CAPEX, meaning capital expenditures, buying things yep. to operational expense is defining all of technology from, yeah. you know, I, from online IT to the film industry. It's just yeah. the way people Great. are doing Yeah. It. It's even, it's even, we even rent software, you know, so, that's why the uh, next ge- next generation of, of kids aren't even buying cars now, right? It's like, why would you buy a car? That's a huge purchase for no waste of money. You can just rent and, you know, and car share and Uber when you need, you know, and all of that. It's becoming very clear to the next generation. They're absorbing OPEX as the only way to do things. And so, yeah, we're yeah, aging out. I was really resistant to it <laughs> when it first started. But no, I love it now. And it's, well, and I think that that's going to be the answer for the LED walls. Because you know they're going to increase the uh, the the pitch between the LEDs is going to keep getting smaller and smaller and better and better higher mm-hmm. resolution and and you don't want to have last year's LED wall you're going to want a new one the newest one the latest greatest yeah soon you won't need to worry about the the mesh and the moray pattern stuff coming up in another year or two I think that 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 will be a game changer once uh, there's not a limitation to how far away you you have to get to shoot on an LED wall. Cause that's, that's one of the biggest hurdles right now. If you, you know, some of the ones we've been working with, you have to be, uh, you know, 12 feet away. And- yeah. Well, that's also why some of the shops are making some pretty big ones again, yeah. NDA, but there's some very, very large studios coming up in the, in this, this 2021 oh, where, yeah. you're gonna, where you're going to see whole, you know, crowd scenes mm-hmm. and, you know, very large props and, and whole sets built inside yeah. these things. You also, uh, not only have you just been working on visual effects, but you've gone into some other areas of entertainment as well. I think the, the co- one of the cool areas that I was really impressed by, not just with you, but a lot of the other folks at ILM at the time, was this whole idea of what eventually became battle bots. And, the, and the, before that, there was iterations of like robo games and robot wars and different sort of events going on. But I'll tell you, when you come out of the mail room at ILM and all of a sudden you see deadly robots coming across the, side, the parking lot at 30 miles an hour with, a, with an axe, um, <laughs> it, can, it was a little intimidating at first uh, sure. but it was fun watching all of the uh, development of all the robots that was happening uh, after hours and and there was a lot of ILMers involved with that in the early yeah. days um you grant jim spintowski um what were you you what was the name of you mouser i think was the name of one mouser. of your famous was it yeah mouser mecha catbot was was my robot it was a very popular robot for a time yeah, I could see that in some of the, um, I was watching some of the promotional stuff and, and it kept coming up uh, in, in discussions and some live uh, comic con or some sort of con events that you were doing there on a panel. Um, yeah, and, uh, and and then you were a host for a while, correct? Is that? 
Uh, celebrity judge. Celebrity judge. You've been a celebrity judge on a few shows. I think I saw you on, on it's not Cake Wars. The, uh, what was the one with the... Uh... Oh, I did actually. I helped Duff Goldman make some really weird special effects cakes. <laughs> so that was kind of a guest, guest hosting. Uh, yeah, I've guest hosted on some talk shows and things as well. Um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's, it has, it coincides almost, uh, exactly when I moved to Los Angeles, there's just a lot more on camera work down here. So I'm asked to, to not just do the work, but do the work on camera and then talk about it. So it's, it's been really exciting to kind of branch out in that way. A while back, like at IMD, uh, I remember uh, introducing Brad Isdrab to you and you always had this mentoring ability, whether it was your doing instructionals or stuff I've even just seen for free on YouTube about you explaining how to how to plan out your workflow or your your clipboard of steps that you can get your materials oh, right. get your, you know like this idea of, of mentoring and whether it was you know the, the effect you had on Brad which I saw immediately in his creativity or whether it's just the effect on the community it's it's nice to see you know what granted what other people do is share it out there it's, it's becoming a mentor becoming yeah. uh, offering up the services offering up the information so that it's not like you're hoarding you you want to share and I appreciate always yeah. appreciated that about you that you had that mentoring style you always welcomed me into the mail room you when i first got to imd you know you immediately had to show me the whole model shop and how and what you're doing and the in the in the various uh, oh, it's to there too. <laughs> yeah, it was fun to be there <laughs> when i first started in the industry there were a lot of people that held uh, trade secrets they called them you know and, and they really just held their hands you know they held their cards close because they didn't want anyone to know what they did because you were competing for jobs mm -hmm. you know against those people and and they didn't want to show you their tricks um but I was in an interesting place because I was of a generation when a lot of those people were starting to uh, think about retirement. Uh, and also, you know, I, I was fortunate in that early in my career, it was also so darn busy. We had so many, you know, we had over a hundred model makers in the model shop. So the sharing of information between people was so essential to who I am now as a person, you know, um, it's, it's essential to my entire company. You know, I, I learned all of these things from other people. And the, and the fact that people were so open with me, I do feel a certain amount of responsibility to give back, you know? Um, and that's why I started to do the educational work. When I got, when I first started on social media, the first thing that happened is, you know, total strangers were hitting me up for advice on how to do, uh, you know, different things. And there was no, information out there. And that's why I did the educational DVDs and, and started to um, do talks at schools and, and talks at the different conferences and conventions and all that kind of stuff to just share all of those tricks. As I was doing that, I realized that, that it's not just about tools, materials, and techniques. It's also about, um, you know, how you approach people, how you approach organization, you know, and, and it, it, it's just you know, the information that I'm passing on is a lot broader than it used to be, I think, hopefully a more useful um, because I got all of that. What I didn't realize is, is at the time when we were at ILM, that was the best of the best. So when I left ILM, I just assumed everyone worked the same way everywhere else too, and they didn't. And so I did find myself in the role of trying to um, kind of lift people up to that quality of work and that camaraderie and that you know, I, I do feel like the personal relationships we had was so much a part of the quality of work that we produced, mm -hmm. you know, so and I think that's the component that, that is not often taught. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a big deal. Obviously, I've given some thought <laughs> and I, I really do try to uh, give back as much as I can because I wouldn't have um, anything if it weren't for people who had shared, uh, you know, their hearts, their souls, their you know, trade secrets mm -hmm. uh, uh, with me. And yeah, that so, selflessness, that, that selflessness that came out of the, the ILM culture. Uh, I was, I was um, blessed enough to work in a series of studios after ILM that were effectively born of that culture, you know, that yeah. culture that Chrissy and Patty and everyone built. Um, and so whether it was the orphanage or whether it was image was digital, it wasn't until I went to Disney, which is its own wonderful culture. I'm not dogging Disney at all. It has its own very, very unique culture. Yeah. That's really strong and deep. I was so moved by that um, Imagineering documentary they, they put on Disney plus that I bought a bronze statue of Walt Disney. <laughs> it's just so yeah. admirable. I think, I think, you know, I, you know, I think that the, the Lucasfilm and Disney marriage is actually perfect. 
Disney and, and Lucasfilm have something in common in, in that the, the artistry is, is important. The quality control is important. The vision and the culture is important. And, and that's a real emphasis on culture. Um, I remember I really loved that about working at Disney because I worked for Disney five years before ILM on Skellington, you know, Skellington Productions. And then mm, I did right. it IMD. Yeah. That was under Disney. And uh, every time I get an opportunity to work with Disney, or Lucasfilm, those those are my two favorite companies, and now they're one company. So great. <laughs> I wanted to ask a little bit more about what you've been working on. We you know, model making in twenty twenty one is a little, I think, mysterious for some people. I mean, we've given some great examples of relevant things like the 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 brisk ad and and, and, and things like that. And obviously, there's still droids being made. We've seen that in in, in recent really cool uh, uh, shows that Disney put Disney and Lucasfilm are putting out. Yeah. So let me ask you more about this. What is the role here of physical model making and, and, and in a modern day sort of CGI universe? Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. That's a good question. You know, it's funny for me. It's, it's, I have a completely different perspective on miniatures in the industry than a lot of people um, because there's this perception that when computer graphics came along, um, it just uh, replaced miniatures. And it's not been the case. It's just that the amount of visual effects work has grown exponentially. So the percentage of the work that's being done with miniatures versus uh, computer graphics has, um, you know, the computer graphics side of it has just exploded. And it, it, it does overshadow the work we're doing with miniatures, but we still do quite a lot of uh, work with miniatures. It's still less expensive. It's still easier to get a, a photo real quality from miniatures uh, that sometimes is a struggle in computer graphics if you don't have that tremendous, you know, Michael Bay or J.J. Abrams uh, budget, you know. Absolutely. And really, I think it's all about layers of new technology. I mean, you see, you know, I was looking, I think your Morav project, which is one of your passion projects you've been working yes. on for, for a few years. Um, I was looking at that and it can, it follows some of the same kind of idea, idea that you have physical models, then you also can scan those and you can make digital versions of those. You can make real time, you know, now you've got real time rendering going on with that. You've got um, mocap involved, all the virtual production layers, you know, you right. can circle all the way back to like what you're seeing in the Mandalorian when I, uh, spoiler alert, um, where maybe a droid shows up, you know, in a movie and you know that now you've got physical droids with physical light panels reflecting off of things. And yet they're still touching it up with CG, but it's yeah. all about layers. It's very little technology has supplanted or removed the old technology. I mean, there's certainly upgrades to things, but in the end, Jen, there's always been, you know, they're still painting background mats and putting people in front of them. Now they're doing them digitally, you know, uh, they're, they're still doing model making. They're, 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 they're still doing classic mocap. They're still doing green screen real, real time. They're still, now they're doing, you know, it's, it, it all comes together to layer on top of each other. So now you're going to see models inside virtual production studios with, you know, real-time rendering happening. It, it, it's all complementary. Yeah, that is exactly how Fonco has survived through the years, is I've always been kind of a tech head myself. Um, you know, I've never made the full leap into, uh, I guess I did work on a, some full CG movies. I worked on Mars Needs Moms and, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Christmas, Christmas Carol. Carol. But those were... Um, you know, those are, I was, I was still in the, I was in the art department. So it wasn't like I was in the CG department, but I did a lot of work in computers. Um, but I think that that was the way I kind of carved a, a good niche of work at ILM. It was uh, the same way that we carve a good niche niche of work in um, the industry here at Fonco. We have a performance capture volume, as you mentioned, you know, we have uh, 3d printers, we have laser scanners, we have um, Unreal workstations, so we're, we're right in there doing the uh, virtual production work on features now. Uh, we provide um, computer assets for those Unreal environments, you know, and, and it's the same, same approach that we've used in the past for um, computer graphics. We'll, we'll scan the objects. We're working on a, a big feature called Gods of Mars, and we've actually got several different pipelines and, and most of them involve creating something physically and then scanning it or photographing it or, or modeling it and then 3D printing it and painting it. We have all these different workflows to get photo real looking objects into the Unreal Engine. 
Yeah. And you I'm know? really, it's all about just making something, I guess uh, my wife, Johanna has, you know, worked at ILM there. She once quoted Scott Farrar saying, you know, it's hard to make fake things look real. And it's, just, you know, it's a very simple thing to uh, say, but it, in fact, uh, it, it's really hard to take these fake things and make them look real, but really that's what you're doing. And you're looking to do it the cheapest, fastest way possible. So whether that's taking two styrofoam cups, gluing them together, painting them white, I won't mention the movie. I don't know if we're allowed to, but you know what I'm talking about. I and mean, that's a, I mean, you guys probably did that in every movie. I saw styrofoam cups all the time in, in my shop or whether it was you know hand carving and having boat builders come in to build uh, a model ship for for pirates right uh, it, it's really like you just need to do the minimum amount and obviously for the ship they needed the ship but if you just need to fake it you know whether it's you know putting something together stuff together scanning it in um it, it's just about the final product and what gets you there doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether it was q-tips in the if you look at the phantom menace right the crowd scene done with q-tips i mean who would have guessed right i mean you, yeah does it matter that it's Q-tips? No, it looked great, you know? And yeah, it, it was fantastic. I actually, I brought, I mentioned this a few days ago. I actually bought the first box of uh, Q-tips from the Thrifty, which I think was what it was over there and in the Montecito, uh, over back to the mall shop when I was in the mailroom because you guys wanted to do a test of what it looked like when wind blew across Q-tips. And then I remember when the big pallet of Q-tips came in <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <laughs> there was over a million, million of those. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. And, it, and, uh, and it was just an example of, it's just all about faking it. It really doesn't matter how it gets there. You want to yeah. get it there the cheapest way possible uh, with the least amount of effort that makes it look cool enough. Is the difference between an amateur and a professional model maker. The yeah, there you go. professional model maker um, takes pride in how little time they spend on something. <laughs> and the, the amateur model maker takes pride in how long they spend on something. So it'll be like, I spent a year making this ship perfect. And we're like, I did it in a day. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I got my uh, feet wet in the industry working Colossal Pictures before I, I was at Skellington on Nightmare and before um, uh, ILM, of course. And uh, that was a really, really, um, you know, kind of a, a, a low budget, lower budget studio, I would say, not low budget, but it was lower budget. One of the things that, um, uh, that, that we used to do there that was really funny is uh, back then we were doing stuff for television and movies. And so if, if uh, you know, an art director might walk in and look at what you're building and try to decide, is it done enough? Because you don't mm -hmm. want to spend extra time on anything because the budgets were so tight. So they would wave their hand in front of their face and go, yeah, okay, that looks good. If it looks good through their hand, then it looks good for, for camera. And then because of film grain and all these things that help make it, you know, uh, look better quality. And then if it was for television, you put, use both hands. <laughs> <laughs> and then came 4K. <laughs> yeah. No, that did change it. Because back then, uh, television was 640 by 480. If you can believe it. I look oh. at it. 640 by 480 today and i'm like i can't believe we ever watched that garbage practical is starting to look more appealing the, the higher the the uh resolution of these cameras <laughs> yeah if you took a nice 4k camera and you took that r2 and you go stick it in a virtual production studio with the reflections coming off and all that the mm -hmm. amount of energy it would take to recreate that in a digital world is mind-blowing you know yes. to make it look that good because it's all yeah. about making it look that that final that final 10 percent of good takes 100 percent more energy then yeah, the night, you know, there's, there's a, isn't that that's a quote somewhere, right? That, that it oh, takes, I just see it everywhere. There's yeah. there's the 90 10 and 80 20 rules. I just find her like the the Tao of life. I mean, they're just everywhere, right? It's every, 80 20 or 90 10. And, it's and so uh, true. yeah, no. yeah, I think I think having a grasp on what what is is needed versus what uh looks great in person is is a key. But uh, you know, you know, just going back to the technology, the technology has been a huge reason we've um been able to stay relevant in film production is because we've integrated all of that technology into every department that we have at the studio. And that's something I think you even back in the days of ILM, I mean, even though you were in a model shop and yes, there might have been CG going on, but there were, there were 3D scanners, there were laser cutters, there was, um, you know, all kinds of automated cutting and, and of CAD and, and the integration of CAD, yes. just like CAD fed visual effects in a lot of ways. I mean, Autodesk and, you know, treats my and its CAD programs kind of from the same thought process. So did the model shop and it was doing digital and taking digital and outputting digital. It, it really was integrated. It wasn't just models and furry creatures it's true um, i remember people would be surprised when we said yeah well in the computer room blah 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 and they're like you have computers in the model shop what on yeah. earth do you do with computers <laughs> Had a whole room full of computers in fact that's how i stayed connected to the model shop was in the mail room of course i had to deliver everything all the from everything from explosives to 
to eyeballs from the taxidermy place. Uh, and then, uh, then I went over to IT and then we were supporting, of course, your IT environment. And yeah, there were dozens of computers in the, in the model shop. It was just as high tech as the rest of ILM, <laughs> really. You once said, you like blowing things up. <laughs> and I, I gotta say, it was one of my favorite parts of being at ILM was explosions. Yes. Um, I think you learned a lot of lessons. The one lesson I learned from Jeff Heron directly, and he was right, was they don't always know, they know exactly how much explosive force is going to be there. They know how it's going to look. I mean, to a to an art form, they know how it's going to look. That's what they're going for. It's a millisecond. Yeah, but they don't always know how loud it's going to be. <laughs> and that was one thing you learned at ILM was they'd always let us know on the PA if there's going to be a big boom uh, on the slab or a big bang on the slab. But boy, sometimes, even if they were in the fire department, they still came because yeah. that was too loud and it would shake all of San Rafael. <laughs> it was just well, amazing. Fireballs, sometimes we would shoot, shoot at night and there'd be these giant fireballs that you could see for probably a couple miles. It was, mm -hmm. it was flat land around there. We were in that valley. So I didn't know this trick till I saw you mention it. The idea of filling up models with uh, painted uh, pasta. To pasta like yeah, that, was that was a great trick. Was, you know, when you do this stuff for a living and you work around so many uh, brilliant people like we did at, at ILM, I always called it the brain trust. Uh, if you ever ran into anything that you felt like was taking too long, you just ask somebody and someone will have the answer as to how to do it faster or better or whatever. Um, and when you uh, blow up miniatures or uh, uh, probably the same with larger objects, I usually work with miniatures. Um, when you blow up a miniature, the debris flies by the camera so fast that it, it can actually pass the camera within that one frame of, of photography. So you end up needing a lot, a lot more debris than you think you would uh, when you're blowing up miniatures. And so we would have to just pack these things full of debris and we, we'd have extra parts and stuff from the model and reject castings and things like that we throw them, but we'd always need more. And one of the tricks that I learned there is you could just take pasta, you lay it out and you spray paint it gray and black and white, maybe some red oxides, some ugly colors, and then you break it up and you stick it in the model. Um, and we would always have this, you know, this collection of debris that had to, we had to pack into those miniatures before we blow them up and they would look great. They'd look great in person. You'd be like, whoa, man, it looked like a pasta factory exploded. But when you look at the footage, it was perfect. Cool. And out of all those explosions that you were working with and stuff and blowing up things, was there anyone that really, like when you think back, is the explosion that you always think of? Yeah, I got so excited. We were, we were actually, this was at New Deal Studios. We were working on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. And there was a shot where uh, Rocket is in this mining spacecraft and he, he realizes this thing is super strong and impervious. So he actually plows it right through another spacecraft. And so we shot that scene and uh, Richie Helmer was the pyro guy for that. Um, and uh, Ian Hunter, of course, was overseeing the miniatures work on that. And I was helping coordinate. Um, and they, they basically hung the, the spacecraft from a cable and dropped it down through some gasoline bags. So they explode those. And so you had three fireballs. I think it was three. And then the ship came out through the fireball with flames licking off the face of it. And the camera's just on the ground pointed up at this, right? Um, and I remember this is, of course, we're shooting digital. So not like in the old days where we had to wait till the next day to see the shot. Um, <laughs> it was late at night. We we're outside and they shot, uh, shot it and the, the fireball goes and the ship comes through it. And then we all huddle around the monitor for playback. And it was beautiful. It was, it was the most beautiful pyro shot I've ever seen because it wasn't just the fireball. It was the fireball and you could see the ship kind of emerge from it. You could see the flames kind of lick around the outside of the ship. And I got so excited when I shot, saw it, I just like burst into like random handshakes with everyone around me. <laughs> it's like, congratulations. <laughs> that was the best pyro shot I've ever seen. And it, to this day, it is still the best pyro shot I've ever seen. I kind of wish they hadn't put all the other stuff in it. <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> I very, very rarely have favorites, but that one was a standout for sure. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. Um, I, did you, I learned a lesson when they shot Men in Black that I didn't know about until they shot Men in Black, the idea of making the second ship. 
So if that one, you, know, you only get one shot to do that kind of explosion. It's not a digital world. You can't render it again with a tweak the next day. And yeah. so the question is, did you guys have a second ship or was this one, one, one take, you better make it work? That one they were able to use multiple times because it was, it was a, a, mo a model that was basically unpainted. It was, it was all black. Oh. It was there and it had all the shape of the spaceship, but what, what it would do is- Oh, because they could touch that up with CG. Uh, yes, yeah, so they put the CG model in was it? Shot, and it would all line up perfectly because they built the actual model in miniature to launch it through the fireball. So, and for the record, for the men in black shoot, they didn't need to use the second one. So they ended up getting mounted in, the, in ILM. Yeah, we did the same thing on yeah. um, Mission Impossible 3. We built uh, multiple helicopters. We ended up with one that we didn't end up using at all. <laughs> And then I think a bunch of those cars that were used in Men in Black or in the first Mission Impossible were reused in Men in Black tunnel sequence or something like that. Or I know you guys were often. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. We, we reuse anything if if uh, cars, buildings, airplanes, anything that's just kind of civil. We keep tons and tons of that stuff around. And I, I knew the model shop first after the mailroom, so I was really blessed to find that that was my entryway into the ILM world. I think Mark Anderson had just taken over. Keith yep. London took it charge after that but the real secret behind this the, was kevin wallace who yeah. <laughs> was the, the he was right. sort of the coordinator guy behind the scenes and he made sure that fawn and every one of those artists just had whatever they needed to their left or to their right yeah. when they needed it it's phenomenal um, him yeah him originally preston donovan although i think preston eventually became a model maker you know and i think even yeah. kevin moved on obviously being a model maker but those uh those support people in in uh are the real unsung heroes. I just did a video on the render wranglers, you know, being these unsung heroes, these folks that really sort of stand underneath the artists and hold the floor for them so they can work. Um, and uh, a lot of those folks in these studios that often don't get credits, you know, I don't know if Kevin even got credit, you know, but those oh, yeah. folks really- yeah they, pretty, yeah, they were pretty tight on, on credits at that time, for sure. Yeah, I never got a credit ILM, fortunately. Um, it wasn't until I went to the orphanage uh, that I finally started getting credits. A smaller, smaller pond, bigger fish, right? Every time you added a layer of, a name to a credit scroll, you were adding feet of film times tens of thousands of copies that needed to be, that the studios needed to make. So just yeah. adding a name, a lot of people are like, hey, why can't I just add my name? It's like, that's like adding like, you know, $10,000 to the cost of the film to add your name. And people don't, in the digital world, I'm a little more uh, like, they can fit yeah, it. I think that now. they've loosened up a lot more too. And they've packed a lot more in. I think Avatar yeah. was the first time I saw a full paragraph style. Um, I think that was like the full paragraph style or maybe one of the Star Wars movies where they just started to just pack in the names. Better to be on there. You can always pause the DVD. <laughs> in general, the model shop, again, was kind of like my first family outside of the mailroom. And it was really nice to, I, I just posted this again on Facebook that, you know, after a year at ILM, I realized what it was like to have a 700 you know, person, family, right? And, and it grew yeah. to more than that. And I the never felt so close. About this industry is, and, and it's, it's very much what our studio here in LA is built on is that, uh, you know, those different communities, you know? And, and when true, you join that community, it's like you and I, we're, we, we've been friends for decades, you know, because yeah, we're, we're part of that family. Once you're in those trenches, once you've really yeah. sweat together, once you've, you know, struggled through some rough times and unloaded a truck in the pouring rain to get that thing, you know, you've really just, you know, been there, hustled to get something like when the mailroom would hustle something to get to the, to the, to the, to the mall shop because they were waiting for it. And just that hustle that everyone had to support them, you start to yeah. really bond. And, um, and, and of course there, there is a downside to that. And, and the downside is, as I'm getting older <laughs> is I didn't expect to have thousands of family members that as they get older and retire, or even some recent tragedies, you start to lose your friends. I'm now starting to to lose some of those friends due to, you know, the times. Um, yeah, now- This last year's been, been rough. Yeah, I mean, in your, your, your model shop career, I think you, you grew really close to, to Granny Mahara. Yes. Um, I mean, we all did. I mean, he was it, it was, it was such a treat for all of us to see his success because he was, unless you knew him personally, he really got, you know, he was, considered a pretty quiet in the corner guy. I mean, most of us didn't expect that he was going to become a, a TV star. <laughs> um, and yet look, what was it? That spark came out of him that, that, that you guys got to see your close friends. Got yeah, to yeah. See. We all got to experience it. Um, maybe you could tell me a little bit about your experience with Grant, if you're okay with it. And then, and, and what it yeah. was like, um, you know, working with him. And I've seen collaborative work in Fonco going back 10 years ago with Morav yeah. and things like that. It was really kind of tearing my heart up watching some of your footage. What, yeah. was, it like, what was it like working with Grant? <laughs> Okay. Oh, beautiful. Can't go too far with those. Yeah, try to rotate. He was like a brother to me. 
Uh, Grant, well, Grant and I, we, we uh, hit it off, it, you know, in 1996. It was April of 96. We got a job doing the electrical work underneath the Global Olympic Village miniature uh, for the AT&T commercial. And we were underneath the set. It was our first, you know, first project there. And we were both underneath the set wiring hundreds of lights. And it was like the perfect way to meet somebody, you know. So he and I were just underneath there and we were just talking and you know, it's, it's one of those moments you don't know each other. So we we're just like, so uh, have any siblings, you know, where'd you go to school? You know, what, what brought you here? And, and we both started talking about how excited we were to be there and, and how, you know, what our path was to get there and what our interests were. And I, I think from that day forward, we, we were best friends, you know? Um, and of course we would stay late there, uh, working on our battle bots at night. Um, he would, had this magical, uh, I, it's funny, the first feeling that I think about is how I was always hungry and he was never hungry. Um, <laughs> it's funny the things you remember, right? Um, but yeah, so we did that. And then, um, you know, uh, when he went off and did Mythbusters, we stayed in touch. Uh, you know, we used to, uh, we did a costume party together <laughs> and won a trophy <laughs> nice. uh, as a superhero duo. Um, for the yeah. record, Grant was always a bit of a ringer at the Halloween parties. I mean, yeah. you know, Grant Nelson Obviously, too. No, he's very, you know, infinitely creative. I mean, so many <laughs> people were, of course, but yeah, he had some. He had some really great ideas. <laughs> then uh, when when he uh, sold his condo, moved down to Los Angeles. Actually, was was the same time I moved down here too. So his his um, his workshop is here at Fonco Studios. So it was it was pretty. Uh, it's still pretty difficult, you know, walking the hallways here and not, not seeing him around, you know, uh, it's been tricky, you know, and we've, you know, um, uh, so, you know, but working with him was, was great. It's everything you would expect it to be. That was one of the things that I really enjoyed about Mythbusters. And one of the reasons I probably didn't watch it as much as people <laughs> that didn't know them is it just felt like you were hanging out with your friends. They, what you saw on camera was not celebrity versions or hamming it up for the camera versions of any of the people on that show that was just that was just those people being themselves and that's how special they were you know that's so. what it was like being around the model shop i mean that that was that same sort of camaraderie the, yeah. the joking was the challenging always challenging each other there was no nobody got away with anything you know like <laughs> uh you know in a good way you know you've made each other better you said Man, that's not, i don't think it's the way to do it and you know and you see that it would see it happen in the episodes yeah, when, when Scott, Scott McNamara, one of the model makers in the uh, model shop, he was a, a very talented machinist as well as a model fabricator. Um, he, well, the first time he saw uh, Mythbusters, he said, I felt like I should fill out a time card when I was done. Because <laughs> you're just watching your buddies do stuff that you do at work, you know? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was a, a great, great avenue for him to grow. And then, of course, yeah. he got into some other... Uh, you know, other projects and the, the whole Star Trek uh, spinoff kind of thing that they did. And yeah, um, it's, it was a real pleasure. It, it was my last interaction with him because of course, after he passed away, I had to go look in my like messenger and say, what was the last thing we, and, and it was, uh, you know, we weren't as close, nothing like you we were, you know, just coworker close, but uh, I had a render wrangler uh, of mine and she'll probably be embarrassed if she hears the story. Um, she, she got hired. I was up here in Canada and I just mentioned Grant and model shop something. And she's like, you know, Grant, and I was like, oh, of course, yeah, no, yeah, Grant, he's, you know, he's a young guy. Yeah, I know him. And she's, she was like, oh, my God, he's like my favorite. That's why she watches Mythbusters. She just was really into his whole brain, you know. And uh, so I, I, I saw her birthday coming up. And I was like, hey, Grant, can you send a friend request to, to her? And, and of course, he did it. And, <laughs> and so she came in the next morning like, oh, my God. And, and it was just so cute. It was just Grant. But it was just so cute to see that, you know, and that effect he had, that he became a, a celebrity. And he was lovable. He was likable. He was, he was just as cool and likable as you saw on, on TV. So. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, it's yeah. been painful for all of us. I think, uh, you know, we've lost a lot of people. I kind of started this, this segment by saying that, you know, we've, we recently just lost Steve Collins, a, a union yeah. driver that was, you know, tears me up to think about, you know, um, but yeah. uh, this one, I, fixed, this one, our lives for a, a decade, you know? Yeah. But Grant somehow, I think it's probably, we all kind of felt like we were following along in his career and his growth. I think we all just felt a little closer to Grant than a lot of the folks. And it just hit us harder than I expected. I mean, uh, it was a, uh, hard day and, and you you since then worked with a few other folks and and i think you're part of the and helped with the grant imahara foundation is that correct yeah yeah i'm a board member can you tell us a little bit about the foundation 
Yeah, I mean, the, the foundation, basically, uh, Carolyn E. Mahara, that's uh, Grant's mother, um, decided she wanted to put together a foundation in his name uh, for to help, um, you know, younger people who are struggling with uh, getting education, uh, specifically in, in STEAM. Different than just STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, it, it also adds art. We announced it on what would have been uh, Grant E. Mahara's 50th birthday in October. Um, and we're starting to make contacts and we're starting to, uh, support, um, you know, um, some of the things that, that, that Grant would be proud to, uh, support. Um, but if anyone wants to learn about it, we do have a website. We are taking donations. Yep, I'll uh, put a link here in the, uh, I'll put a link right here on the screen, but I'll, I'll put one in the, uh, description as well, as well as I'll probably link again to, uh, Billy Brooks, uh, and, and teams, uh, Wonderful tribute to him, a uh, little CG tribute, uh, which again was is hard to watch, but yeah. is uh, it's uh, yeah he had a great effect on everyone and and I think his 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 he he was a big mentor towards but you know the kids in Oakland there's there's a robotics uh, organization the a kids organization that's still going strong I forgot the name of the team uh, but uh, yeah um, that's you know, one he, of the organizations that we're supporting with the foundation. I appreciate you you opening up about Grant. I know uh, he was close to you and. Um, Again, we'll, we'll all miss him. And uh, there's, there's, uh, he's one of so many great people that came out of that model shop and out of yeah. ILM, not just the model shop, but okay. ILM. Ne never be a bigger group of professionals at the top of their game that I'll see for everyone from CG artists to the, the, the machinists to the camera folks who invented their own cameras. Uh, yeah. it, it, was, it was intense to be around people who were absolutely the best at what can be done. And, and coordinators, PAs, mailroom. Uh, <laughs> purchasing department man we would die without our purchasing department i remember that yeah um, yeah it's something about the visual effects industry and the movie industry in general it's a meritocracy the only people who if you see people who have been in for 10 15 years they're good because they would have never been surviving that long if they weren't the people who yeah. can't cut it or the people who find it's not their thing they fall away pretty quickly and yeah. the people who stick to it they they generally they their their imdb page or their linkedin page is all people need to see and a lot of times like oh you spent 10 years here five years here boom that's all yeah. i need to know and um it's been it's been a wonderful uh, honor to be uh co-workers with so many of those people including yeah. you so. yeah it's, it's, i had heard someone say once that uh working at ilm was like working on the golden gate bridge during the recession I mean, the depression, because uh, you would just look down and you'd see 200 people there waiting to take your job. <laughs> and so it really lit a fire under people and you had to keep up. And we we had a lot of hard work and a lot of innovating and just you had to be the best of the best to survive there. And if you weren't, they'd replace you with someone else. Hardcore. And I had in the mailroom when I took over uh, supervising it. When I would open up a job in the mailroom, I would get resumes from around the world and especially around the country of people who wanted to come to ILM to work in the mailroom. And because we had to be weary of, and I know you've talked about this in other um, interviews, at Star Wars and at Lucasfilm, especially at the time, you had to be very weary of Star Wars extreme fans uh, yeah. getting in the door or getting on campus even sometimes, uh, parking their van out in front and living out of it. Uh, we've seen some pretty crazy things at, at the Lucasfilm yeah. Empire. And so we had to straight up just, you know, anyone who wanted to fly in for an interview to the mailroom, we had to pass on. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> that's kind of weird. Um, but it was, it was an honor to work at a place that literally the, anyone would would have given their their left hand to work there especially during those years there's been a lot more shops ilm is still the premier or a premier visual effects company but yeah. now there are choices there are so many fantastic shops out there that have stood on ILM's shoulders and even gone and passed them in certain areas and yeah. ilm's always doing something new every year a lot, that, a lot of them founded by ex ilmers most of them i mean yeah. Uh, yeah it's crazy you know even going all the way back to scott ross starting digital domain to you know i mean it's just been a long tradition of people leaving ilm i mean pixar Pixar yeah. was ILM. People don't realize that, that there was a time where before Disney and stuff brought all those folks back together, there was a time when ILM sold off Pixar and it, and it was in this little office out in Point Richmond near yep. a Chevron refinery where they had to evacuate once a week due to <laughs> like refinery leaks. Um, and that was Pixar uh, when we, when it first left ILM. Um, yeah, so many students, the orphanage, um, you know, Image Rivers Digital was filled with ex-ILMers. Yep. Um, yeah, they, it's seeded the entire industry. So kudos to all the founders too, those original folks, you know, yep. that really get going, going all the way back to Chrissy England and, yeah. and all the people that really, you know, Jeff Mann and Patty Blau and all the people that really made that place uh, before we got there, what yeah. it was. 
right? We got to inherit their hard work and, and keep it, you know, keep going as best we could. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was great. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, man. Um, I appreciate your time. Appreciate you making time for a cup of Joe here. Um, I appreciate you bringing R2 to the party. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I said, he insisted. He, oh, that's your, he just wanted to see you. Nice. <laughs> <It's co-worked. laughs> Of course, we go way back, all the way back to the special edition. That's right. <laughs> I'll put all the information about uh, Fonco and, and all the work you've done and your IMDb and everything down in the uh, description. So please read on. Um, your background is prolific. Uh, you you are now officially a like a, um, a real historic veteran in the visual effects industry. Uh, you, you're up there. Along, you may not you know feel it, but you're up alongside Lauren Peterson, alongside <laughs> all those guys. <laughs> Golly, um, all those guys, you, you're up there with the man. You are part of the legacy, and it's been a real Thank honor you. to have you here as part of this uh, this podcast because uh, um, you know, you, you've meant a lot over the years to me, and, and you're always real friendly and down to earth, and here you are still down to earth as ever. So thanks, awesome. buddy. Thank you. Thank you.